Okay. Well, Mike, and thank you, everybody. A um, few familiar faces here, and uh, Steve, you just blinked out. I need to be able All to right, see I'll, your face. I'll put it back. <laughs> so, uh, uh, yeah, just a little bit about tonight. Go ahead and unmute yourselves. Uh, I just spent, uh, oh gosh, several painful hours listening to to Zooms at a photographer conference in Kanab, and some of them were just absolutely painful. Um, it was just somebody talking to a screen for over an hour with no response at all. Um, so uh, I do crack a joke or two, and it's just much better to hear them laugh rather than just <laughs> the dead silent screen. And thank you, whoever just chuckled. So, um, yeah, so unmute, and uh, I'm actually okay with uh, questions as we go. Uh, and it's a small group, so I don't see any problem with just, uh, just breaking in and asking a question. Um, what I do ask is that keep questions to the topic. Um, if it's a story or something about your gear or about a trip, save that for a break or, or at another time. And... Um, so I like to say I never ask for questions at the end. Uh, <laughs> thanks, Scott. Because how many times have you sat through a presentation, the speaker has given his or her heart for however long, and OK, are there any questions? And you get that same pregnant pause, no answers, no questions, and it's embarrassing. So I don't like to be embarrassed. So uh, ask questions as they come up. Um, a little bit about tonight. Um, this was actually kind of fun and uh, it came up, concept came up with Mike and it's a little about uh, surreal scapes or introduction to experimental art. Um, sounds a little bit wilder than it actually is because this is stuff just that we normally do with our cameras and with our, uh, our post-production. A little bit about me. Some of you know me pretty well. Um, I was uh, born and raised on a farm near Sacramento, uh, spent hours and hours, got uncounted hours driving tractor as a pre-teenager and teenager. So uh, uh, it taught me two things. One, that I did not want to work straight on the farm and drive any more of those damn tractors. <laughs> and it also got me pretty good and pretty comfortable about being alone. And I'm, I'm quite comfortable and happy um, being solo, uh, in addition to being in with groups, which makes it kind of nice for solo trips, which are uh, uh, really kind of important for me. And uh, I'm looking to get out next month for at least a three or four day trip, maybe into the wilds of Nevada. Started photography as a preteen and uh, uh, kind of kept at it a little bit through my uh, career. I was in agriculture and I spent 35 years uh, growing, producing, selling, and managing vegetable seed. So a lot of the tomatoes, peppers, cucumbers, squash, zucchini, and all those good things that you eat, uh, a lot of those came from our company. Uh, and it was an exciting career, it took me all over the world. Uh, but come January 9th, 2009 at nine o'clock in the morning, I walked out and left it behind and have been doing uh, photography uh, pretty much full time ever since. And it's been a blast, have not turned back. Um, so a little bit about myself, that's me. What all would you like to take home tonight? You have me for about an hour. And some of you know that I ask these type of questions when I get started. So uh, let me get back to my Zoom window here. Okay, Steve, you're first. What would you like? Inspiration. Inspiration, okay. <clears throat> that's, a, that's a wide open question. Tony and Mary. I would like to just start getting a good definition in my head on the modern, on what's going on out there with the term art and photography. Um, 
Oh, okay. I'm lost. <laughs> oh, all right. Um, well, we had a we had a wonderful speaker, and he's a good guy to follow. Who is a student of art and an amazing landscape photographer, and his name's Guy Tal, uh, G U Y T A L. And Hutch is nodding. He's an amazing guy, and he knows art. He also knows philosophy. I'll uh, pop his um, his website up at some time tonight, and you guys will be able to see the link. But uh, uh, okay. I've learned a lot from him. I've never had any formal training. Well, scratch that. I've never had any training at all in art or even studied. Uh, so uh, Guy was an inspiration, and there's a lot to it. Yeah, that'd be good. I'd like that. OK. Scott. Yeah, I'm, I'm just trying to learn some other techniques besides my background in photojournalism. Oh, OK. So that's, uh, I've been playing on the iPhone for a decade, but uh, um, kind of ran out the, kind of got bored with that. My wife said, my stuff was not as good now than it was five or seven years ago. <laughs> oh, nice. Textures and things like that I do on the iPhone. So okay. looking for new inspiration. Cool, cool, cool. Okay, Hutch, your turn. How to beat you at ImageConf. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, I've been thinking about what you used to say, Hutch, when you'd ask where I took a photograph and I wouldn't say, and you'd say, yeah, that Dan, he never kisses and <laughs> <They> never tells. <laughs> so you're not gonna get all my secrets. <laughs> There's a few things you're gonna have to figure out on your own. Great, Ken. See, I'm here. Yeah. Uh, well, I've been taking pictures for probably over 80 years. Nice. Um, I haven't really, explored all the avenues and I've never gotten into this uh, artsy craftsy type of thing. So I've stuck pretty much to the straight and narrow of landscape photography and portraits and things like that. And I'm just sort of curious about what one can do with the um, imagination, how you can take a landscape photograph or whatever it might be and use it as a paint by numbers thing. That's, that's kind of how I look at it. <laughs> Awesome. I'm typing these things down. Okay. Okay. And uh, okay. Larry White, you're black, but you're on. Um, I want to learn new techniques. You're pretty darn good already. I think, uh, I think we could learn quite a bit from you. Um, Dennis. Yeah, um, I'm, I'm always interested in learning new techniques. But I also wanted to point out that one time you really embarrassed me. Um, I was down, I was down at uh, Ventura, down on the beach, photographing the sunset. And I looked at this guy out there, not paying any attention to the sunset, he's throwing rocks on the ground. There's three rocks, I don't know if you remember those. And taking pictures of them, I was waiting, oh, over here is where the sunset is. <laughs> And then I uh, and then I got over to where you were and, I th and uh, you said something and I thought, oh no, you had just judged at uh, Valley West Camera Club and uh, I thought, oh boy, I really put my th my <laughs> put my head into it that time. That's that's really funny because I sent Dan an email once asking him if he carried those three stones around with him. <laughs> I, I saw him pick him up off the beach and then throw him out on, on the out on the sand. I remember that night, Dennis. I absolutely do. And I've got that picture. We'll see it tonight. Oh, very good. <laughs> if you recognize it. <laughs> okay. Uh Lily. Well, oh there we go. You're not gonna be <laughs> God, um, I didn't really um, have too much of thought because I just love to travel and then mm -hmm. I do very little on post. So okay. um, I have very little creative part in my picture. So definitely like to see what kind of inspiration I can learn okay. to see today. Okay. I don't know how much we'll get into post, but it depends on uh, the amount of questions. But that adds a lot. 
that really does add a lot. And some of it's really quite easy to do. Um, and um, so that uh, we'll see. Thanks, Lily. Uh, Kit. Hi, we don't, uh, we, experimental art is new to us. Okay. But, um, but I have um, a, a sort of a curious question. <laughs> what is experimental yesterday is every day today. What's experimental today may be blasé tomorrow. So yes. what is experimental for today? <laughs> <laughs> That's one of the reasons I'm not going to show Hutch all my tricks. <laughs> uh, we've, I, we've absolutely seen that at PPC and actually PPA also, um, where, uh, where one lady does amazing flower comp composites and uh, she taught those same techniques. And uh, within two years, everybody was doing them. So um, uh, still fantastic work, but it was no longer uh, new. So uh, uh, one of the kind of cool things I saw as I was looking through the pictures that I pulled in and they're not necessarily shot as art, but they just tend to be. So uh, I think a lot of that is just uh, experimenting and trying new things and, uh, and seeing, seeing, looking through the camera to be kind of right there. Okay, uh, John, John Chase. John needs to unmute. Okay, there we go. Oh, maybe not. Oh, there we go. There he is. Oh, you're muted, John. I'm muted. <laughs> okay. Did you have anything, John? No. Oh, just, just interested in what you're going to show. Okay. Okay. Well, that's good. Well, with that, I will, um, and I'm going to be doing this out of. Um, Lightroom, pretty much. No uh, death by PowerPoint tonight. And uh, I'll be jumping back and forth. So absolutely feel free to jump in. So we'll share screen and then we'll do a little slideshow. Let's go to view, enter full screen, surreal scapes.
So, <clears throat> what is a surreal scape? Anybody got an idea? I thought it was a brand new term that I just made up, but actually Wikipedia has an, an, uh, a definition and they call it a surreal landscape. So I looked up what's the definition of surreal? Uh, having the qualities of surrealism. Okay, that says a lot. Uh, or marked by intense irrational realty, reality of a dream. I don't know what that means either. We're losing your sound, Dan. Oh, okay. Let me turn on. Is that is that any better? Uh, it's your microphone. I don't know if you're too far away from it or oh, something. Okay. Is that all right now? Oh, That's yeah. better. Yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, maybe I was talking into my paper here. <laughs> um, surrealism, the principles, ideals, or practice of producing fantastic or incongruous imagery or effects in art, literature, film, or theater by means of unnatural or irrational juxtapositions and compositions. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> okay so that's the whole art lesson here we're uh, we're not gonna dig deep into the who's why's of surrealism i just kind of look at it as the way we shoot uh everything we do with the camera actually prepares and presents something that your eye doesn't really see um, there was a wonderful short story by Jack London about an Eskimo looking at a picture on a wall in a store. And the Eskimo just absolutely could not understand it because that picture did not say anything about what happened before or what happened afterwards. It was only that one slice of, of time. And uh, so even that our eye doesn't see. So how did I start with uh, this surrealism thing? I walked around in front of the camera. This was a slide taken at a workshop by Galen Rowell way back when and stood in front of the camera on a 30 second exposure. That was kind of cool and created my first ghost. So what is a surreal scape? Okay, my definition is any landscape or nature photo that is out of the norm. A photo hat that has something that your eye will not see or recognize or be, or be fooled. Blurs, camera movement, wide angle. And we'll talk a little bit more about wide angle. Um, wide angle does something that I really love in a photograph because it takes all this angle that our eye can't see and squeezes it into a frame that our eye can see. So there's distortion here and it's a really an unreal presentation of reality. So close-ups. Um, telephoto, macro. This, this is actually a 600 millimeter shot out of a big lens. Composites. I think that's kind of what we think of now when we think about creating art with a photograph, but it's not just about composites. Long exposures and stretched colors, enhanced mood, and then playing in Photoshop. This is definitely not real. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> <laughs> it's One thing is, what's that? It's a pink moon tonight. <laughs> it is a pink moon tonight, yeah. yeah. Um, and one thing that's uh, really important when you do play with the moon is make sure that you put the moon behind the clouds. <laughs> Like Peter Lick. Oh, <laughs> Peter Lick. 
I wasn't going to mention that, but as you mentioned, yes. Okay, um, stretching the colors. Now, actually, this was a surrealistic evening, but the colors were there. But the cool thing is those colors only happen for just a few moments and then they're gone. So our eye doesn't even really see what the camera sees. And we're also seeing this nice distortion on the side caused by the wide angle lens. And wide angle just does amazing things with the sky. Say with, what it's wide angle. What's that? What, what lens are you using when you say wide angle? Okay, I'm using a 1635. And I did buy the newer version Canon. And I wish I would have done that a few years ago because the sharpness is a huge improvement. Um, Sigma has some really great stuff. Uh, if I didn't already have the Canon lens, I'd probably consider Sigma. Uh, I don't have a 14. Um, mainly because I'm cheap and also I like to travel light, but a 14 actually I think would be very nice. Hmm. Part of my problem with a 14 is the bulge on the end of the lens and I would have a, I'd have to take more gear to be able to use a, a filter in front of that lens. So, um, So there's a continuum of, of imagery from photorealistic at uh, say 50 millimeters. And that's pretty close to what your eye normally sees. And uh, it's interesting, I took and out of uh, over 140,000 images in this one catalog, I really only have about 2,000 shot at 50. What? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Um, I just tend to not see at 50 when I'm rolling the zoom lens, I'm tending to go wide and it's really rare that I shoot actually at 50, um, unless it's people. Um, so from, you know, full on photorealism and even here, uh, with a polarizer, you can see the polarized sky, it's adding color that our eye doesn't necessarily see to semi-unrealistic, and um, this is just a long exposure to things your eye does not see at all. And I love it when I see this happening in the field. Um, uh, white bark against dark background, uh, black and white, and then dark and everything, and just let the skeleton stand out to completely unreal. And this is complete, this is uh, created in Photoshop. Hmm. Now, Hutch and Larry, you'll have to act surprised when you see this in Image Comp next month. <laughs> now I know what to present against you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's one answer. <laughs> and don't tell him how it did it shot. <laughs> Yeah, he's going to have to figure that out himself, but he's already got some pretty good clues. Yeah. Um, actually, learning how to separate out that tree was, uh, was a, uh, a trip. So I tend to photograph, um, let me go back here, in, um, in things that the eye doesn't actually see. And uh, I'll just go here to natural abstracts. All in. So a lot of what I do is, um, is take what's out there. And um, Mike, you talked about starting to use your telephoto a lot more. And um, uh, I do, I carry a 28300, which is not a landscape lens, but I absolutely love it because I can go from fairly wide to 300 millimeters just by spinning the barrel. And uh, it's one of the things I truly, truly love. It's heavy lens, uh, 
And I also say it saves me 40 bucks a month because I don't have to belong to a gym. <laughs> Dan, which uh, 28300 did you get? I've got the can. Well, I've got two of them actually. I've got the Canon. Um, they just have uh, one version and it's big and heavy, but I love the color. I love the contrast. Um, I'm very used to the push pull now. Um, it's quite good. And then I also have a small uh, Tamron 28300 um, that I'll use for backpacking. And it's oh. definitely not as sharp, but it's really light. Yeah. Uh, not as satisfying <laughs> to you. You really need sharp when you're doing abstracts? Thank you. <laughs> Who asked that? Ken. Ken, yes. Sharpness to me is not the like most critical thing. Uh, and for the longest time, I'd have a show and people would come in and ask, is this a painting? And I was puzzled as to why they would ask. And uh, possibly because it wasn't hyper sharp detail. And I think some of it may be from shooting through uh, wow. polarizer and the grad filters. I think it softens it to a certain extent and you lose some of that hyper, hyper detail. Um, and you can see everything here in this set of images, uh, detail isn't really, really important. Maybe down this guy is pretty cool. Um, but even, even in, in most of this, it's not, it's not about detail. So, um, so, so if you're doing backpacking, why wouldn't a super zoom uh, type of a small camera uh, be of use? You know, it would be. I'm just too cheap to buy one. Compared, uh, to, your, compared to your lenses, they're dirt, dirt cheap. Yes, yes. <laughs> oh, and I did buy a little Olympus um, point and shoot, the waterproof one, which actually is quite good. Chew throw on, does quite a, a lot, and it, it just fits in the pocket. So uh, I've got that. And actually one of our clients in Africa had a Sony with a, a fixed zoom lens, which had a huge reach on it. And uh, that actually looked pretty nice because it was super light. And uh, she had a huge uh, focal range. Um, and uh, if I ever go on another backpacking trip with my brother-in-law, he's going to insist that I get a lighter camera. Did he have to carry the other one for you? Uh, he ended up carrying my tripod. <laughs> so, um, so again, I, it took a while to realize that I tend to photograph with a vision that the eye normally doesn't see. And... Uh, uh, in that case, uh, the telephoto or wide angle is, is awesome. A lot about patterns, about playing with shadows and light. And um, um, and finding some just amazing places in nature. One thing about shooting abstracts, and I'll talk a, a little bit about this with... Uh, in camera movement, uh, which is fun to do, but a lot of times it gives you something kind of like this where there really isn't a focal point. So this is really cool because I remember the place, but to somebody else, I don't know what kind of story this is gonna really tell. I don't see a whole lot of compositional elements. Uh, I just remember walking up over this hill and seeing this amazing red dirt and stripes and striations. So it's one thing about abstracts that are hard is, is how do you continue to tell a story while you're uh, looking at an abstract. So something like this is awesome. I love it. I think people will like it, but I don't think I'd ever enter this in an image competition because I don't, I'm, I'm sure that two out of three judges would go, huh? What is it? Simple little things um, accentuated by a strong vignette and uh, again, telephoto. Does anybody have an idea what this is? 
Looks like water. Looks like a leaf. Okay, cool. <laughs> wrong and wrong. Anybody else? Flower petal. Oh, cool. Yeah, but no. <laughs> Kenyan. Who said that? Kenyan wall. It's a canyon wall. Yes, it is. It's a slot canyon. Oh. And this is a wall that's close to me. Can you see my little? Yeah. Okay. And this is a wall on the other side of the canyon. And this bead of light is coming through from the backside and just giving that tiny touch of rim light on the side. <laughs> But you did it in red. Uh, that was the color. That okay. color red? Oh, yeah. Wow. Yeah. You've seen pictures of uh, Antelope Canyon and the uh, amazing colors you get in the sandstone. Um, the raw file is going to be pretty bland. And so I brought out the red color that was there. But um, uh, pretty much everything you'll see that I do, those colors were there. Uh, except some of the real abstract things, the digital art, uh, and just uh, emphasized. So uh, the red and the blacks and the lines, and I love the way that it plays with your mind. One of these days, if I get brave enough, I'll enter this in image comp and see what happens. <laughs> uh, sand, and you know, we see quite a bit of sand dunes and um, seen some really interesting things, but this is just, again, playing with the um, telephoto and picking out patterns. Telephoto looking in closely at a stand of one tree. Okay. <laughs> It's actually, actually, that is all one tree. Uh, aspens sprout from each other, so that's all genetically one tree. <laughs> and um, John Grust um, scored 100 at state with an image similar to this. At uh, Anybody have a guess where it is? White sands? You're right. What? How much longer? Oh, what was that? Coral Canyon, a uh, coral sand dune. Oh, good, good guess. No, this is White Sands in New Mexico. White Sands? Okay. Yes. Yeah. Close to Los Alamos. So maybe the red sky came from radioactivity. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Simple reflections. Um, that puzzle your eye and then you, you think it's looking at the sky, but then you see these little specks that I left in that help kind of ground it. And another, this was shot across a canyon handheld with a cheap camera. Actually, this, is a, this was a negative uh, a slide uh, and uh, the old Canon consumer uh, 7300 uh, looking at the black dark green and this pattern of these oaks without leaves on it um, I'd love to go back and shoot that again so I could get it sharp from here to here but it is sharp and crisp in the middle and your eye does not see this your eye sees uh, the, the uh, white bark and then the dark green behind it so this is something that's really fun to do is when you're out with your telephoto and uh, uh, all you see is a bunch of stuff. Well, put your tell, take your camera up, look through it, and then just start zooming in looking for patterns. And another one, this is more current. This is in a place I call 59 Mile Road and it's in the coast range. Question, does those tree or oak tree have leaf or, or do not have leaf? Oh, Just good question. Good, Lily. They're, they're uh, completely, it's in the winter and there's no leaves. Mm. So everything in the background is brown and green and the oak tree was just this white bark and uh, gosh, it almost looks like, a, almost looks like lungs. 
Give me a sense so, of the size of that tree, Dan. It's big, uh, Hutch. This was across a canyon. And, uh, well, let's see. Because it almost looks like a bush because of the Oh, bushes. yeah. Let's see. The... Okay. Oh, I lied. Shot at 60 millimeters. Oh, it's a bush. It's a... <laughs> <laughs> Oh, you know, I, I love this uh, notebook here, you know, the notebook we were always supposed to carry and keep track of all of our photo info, which I never did. Here, I've got it now. It's right here. All of the information about the, about the image. So, um, so why Surrealscapes? Oh, I think they're fun. They're creative. Um, they stretch your imagination and uh, kind of keep you from getting bored. And uh, even just a straightforward shot with no extra creativity post or excess, just find these amazing places. And uh, this is a place I call Marble Pocket. Um, we've all probably heard of White Pocket now and you've all heard of the wave. Well, this is Marble Pocket, and if you ever try and find Marble Pocket, you might have a little trouble because it doesn't exist only in my head. This entire formation uh, was covered with Moki marbles, little round sandstone iron marbles, thousands and thousands of them. So, um, and again, why Surrealscapes? Because they're unique. They're unique to you. Nobody else is going to see things in the same way that you do. Uh, this is Two Tracks Canyon in, in Nevada. Uh, a friend told me about this, gave me a napkin map and said, uh, you go here, you go there, you find this road and drive up this um, river wash and you'll find this amazing place. Where, where is it in Nevada? Um, it's, it's, um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, uh, uh no we just give me a town. Just give me a town that's yeah. close to it. Uh, <laughs> Tonopah. Tonopah. Okay. Uh, I know what you're talking about then. Okay. Okay. No kissing and telling here. Um, but that's one of the most spectacular spots I've ever been, national park type imagery or formations. And uh, the only tracks were deer, deers and mine. So hence Two Tracks Canyon. Uh, here's a little bit of an ode to Guy Tal. Guy Tal does a lot of work in the desert and looks for patterns and the designs in the mudlands and the claylands. Do you remember what focal length he said he shoots at mostly? Yeah, he shoots long. Long. Yeah, he doesn't shoot much wide angle. He's not a sky guy. Yeah. He, uh, he did give me a real compliment once uh, when I saw him in Utah. He said, Dan, you're the, you're the cloud or the sky guru. And uh, so I really appreciated that. <laughs> but he, he almost never shoots wide angle. And um, uh, I do. I do. Guy zooms in and looks for patterns and uh, and stories. Yeah, this is shot at 110 um, millimeters. And then we move into just plain abstract patterns in nature. And they get pretty hard to uh, turn something like this into um, an image that's compelling. Uh, it's compelling to me because I remember. I remember how hot it was, and I remember the p potential of a flash flood in this place. Um, but then again, I'm telling the story. It's really more about what you see in it. Um, this was a small, this is, is mud curls on these rocks in the bottom of this canyon. And I don't know where this blue came from, but this is just so cool between the curls and the blue and the blue just happened to be right in the rule of thirds thank you yeah. 
Um, horizontal lines are tough, but in sometimes they do work. Uh, these horizontal curls. And again, this is, uh, yeah, this is at 300 millimeters. And I'm standing about five feet away from this. So this is doing kind of a macro with the telephoto. Mm -hmm. So a little bit about, again, about why do we do this? And talk about impact and first impression. Uh, getting the question, how was this done? You know, what is it? You know, how, where, where did you find this? Um, again, it's all intentional. Unfortunately, this is in the bottom of the Grand Canyon on a side canyon. And I thought this was unique with the comparison between the gold and the dark and then the repeating patterns. Shot at 51. Do you ever use GPS with your uh, XM data? Or do you, have you tried putting that in there so you know where you were? Or you just uh, remember? That's another really good question. Who is that? That's Mike. Oh, Mike. Yep. No. And I banned GPSs from my workshops. <laughs> <laughs> For the same reason, there's no GPS here on anything that I do. Um, I don't need to know exactly where it was. I remember. I don't remember the exact, the exact uh, side canyon of this, but I do remember where I was. I remember the conversations we had. I remember how hot it was. Um, that's the only thing I need to remember. Um, this is Namibia. Again, just something clean, sweet, and uh, simple lines. And uh, I have um, struggled with entering this. And I think I will get brave enough here one of these days and enter this again as a, either illustrative or a landscape. But good question on, on the GPSs. Um, for me, I don't. Uh, I would just as soon not uh, advertise where I take these pictures. Real battery burner too. Oh, is it Hutch? Oh yeah. Okay. It's, um, it's just running all the time, you know, while your camera's on. Oh, sure. It would be. And, and then usually you've got it, you know, you've got it uh, using your, your phone's, you know, actual GPS. So your Bluetooth or your, one way or another, you're connected to your phone. So you're not only burning the battery in your camera, you're burning the battery in your phone. Uh, okay. All the more reason especially on a canyon trip where, uh, you know, it was 10 days and uh, difficult to recharge the batteries. Um, so these, this is a category I call natural abstracts. Um, you know, something that just works for me. These are abstracts I see in nature and uh, they're not, uh, I don't create them in post. I may bring out uh, simple things like this, I think are just, mm -hmm. Nice. It tells a story. It asks a question. Um, the rock was there. I didn't actually place it there, though I have been known to do that before. Dennis. <laughs> um, uh, that's got a very specific point of interest versus some of your others, though, Dan. Yeah, yeah. But that's the whole abstract thing. Um, and. Uh, uh, it's really fun to find this. Now this, um, yeah, it grasps your eye and the root running into it, I think is really pretty fun and pretty cool. The root dead? Was the tree dead? Uh, yeah, this was dead. And this is actually out in um, the desert above the Dirty Devil River in, um, in Utah. And uh, no specific idea, no place, just a dirt road. Let's see where it goes. And got out and there was a really nice area of sandstone formations. And yeah, uh, I, mean, I, like, I like that a lot. Yeah. Cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah.
Okay, so natural abs. Down a little bit. I was one I wanted to see. Oh, cool. Keep going, keep going. Below your peeled, the one below your peeled mud, the black and white with the okay. fat one. Yeah, I'm just curious what it looks like. Ah, I was trying to figure out what it was. Okay. And it doesn't seem hyper sharp. I think I might have moved a little bit. Um, but the mud cracks and then the following lines and then the crack here that leads all into yeah. it, just this tight curve. Um, shot at 35 millimeters here. And if I put this all in there, you'd never get out. Uh, it wasn't that big, but yes. No, that's what it looks like. So. <laughs> uh, yeah, I've got another picture of me covered with quicksand on a solo walk, um, but that's another story. Um, and more mud. Fun stuff. Okay, so a little bit about why we do these. And these are all natural abstracts. These are all just created in camera with, um, uh, with focal length is the big thing. Um, so why else do we do them? Wall hangers, mirrored images, contest winners, lifetime photos, they all have us they all have something that keeps us going back to that image. Um, I noticed that uh, some of my pictures that early on, especially that were really hot, uh, heavily saturated and uh, just really brilliant, uh, looked good when they were in the show, but after a while, I began to get a little bit tired of them. Um, so really what a wall hanger is or a lifetime image is something maybe a little more subtle it's going to hold your interest for a long time. And it's very clean and very simple. Um, makes us ask questions. It puzzles us or just makes us want to look at it. And uh, we hear, you know, a lot of talk about tension. And does anybody have a good uh, definition of tension? Silence. <laughs> it's tension. Yeah. Living at home for a year. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, that's a little bit different kind of tension. April 15th. April 15th. That works. Well, actually, it is. The, you know, it is. It's something that grabs your attention, makes you a little bit uncomfortable and uh, keeps you focused on whatever is causing that tension. So April 15th is, hmm. in a strange way, kind of a good example. Um, I would say in this image, the tension would be just, what the hell is this? You know, compositionally, it's just a big blob of sandstone and, and uh, iron. But the tension would be, what is it and where is it? This I kind of like because it just makes me wonder about what is this, where is it, and the sweep of the line here brings me all the way around to this black gnarly stuff in the back and back up here, look around here, come up, oh I got a cool sky back here, and my eye just kind of yeah. continues to yeah. stay right inside. Yeah, this one, I, I can't put in the words, but I really like it. <laughs> you know, it's just beautiful. Kind of looks like the Sphinx. Yeah. It's like a face. Though. Yeah. But the, oh. the coloring and the, and the it, you know, you've got the, uh, the brightness in there or, you know, against the black. It just... It's stunning. Stunning. Mm -hmm. That's worth the whole evening's presentation there. <laughs> well, Mary and I are not been the, have not been known to lie. <laughs> <laughs> because um, 
you know, I, I, I like to say that, okay, whoever speaks first about an image loses. So if I have to look at an image of one of my photographs and tell you what it's about, you're already kind of waiting for the next photograph or looking for the door. But if I throw up an image and you ask me about it or react to it, that means that an image means something to you. To me, that's a success. That's the definition of a successful image. When it no longer becomes my story, it becomes your story. Uh, it, it has the contrast and it has the depth. Yep. Yep. Yeah. And we even got deep, deep uh, background here right. in, the, in the middle. Right. And the sky. Yeah. It's there. Cool. Cool. Back here. Oh, gee. Okay, so what causes, how are we doing on time here? Like I said, I can go for hours. Um, I'm going to jump into just a little bit. So when, when do we shoot these? Every time you're out, you know, uh, you know instead of standing back and shooting another big open landscape, pull out that telephoto and just start looking. So I broke them into a couple, into some different categories. Um, wide angle. Now this one, this is wide angle. It's a special spot and you'll notice there's no GPS coordinates. This is not horseshoe bend. And actually now you need a permit from the Navajo Nation to, to go here, which I think is fine. This is, um, this is, uh, this is uh, President Harding Rapid is right down here. This slot canyon is actually an access to the river, but we sure couldn't see how you could access that slot canyon. Um, spectacular place. So this is shot at 16. And here I tried to convert that to something that would look like a 50. Okay, it's nice. So I took and cropped it and stretched it to um, fill the frame. Just a wild guess on something that would look like 50 millimeters. Uh, it's nice, but to me, this has a whole lot more tension. Mm -hmm. Okay, this has more grab. Ooh, that's a good way of describing a photo. This grabs. Yeah, yeah I agree. Whew. So here's the difference between 50 and 16. 50 is kind of what our eye sees. 16, our eye does not see. So this is one of the reasons I, I am a big fan of wide angle. Well, actually, our eye does see that way because our brain puts it together. I mean, yeah. We see it totally wide in reality. Um, actually, I'll challenge with, oh, Steve. Yeah. Uh, I'll, uh, you know, I don't think it does. And I think our eye has a very, very narrow depth of field. Well, because if you hold up your finger and look at your focus on your finger, now the screen is out of focus. Oh, yeah. But you have the capability when you're looking at a landscape to pull the whole thing together, even if you can't see it at once. Right, you can't see it at once. Where here, you know, in a landscape, it's, oh, I don't know if you can see my arm spread. It's this 16 millimeters covering like this, but if I'm only looking ahead, it's only showing me this. Yep. Now I look all over, but in a photograph. I That's think why it grabs you, because if you just look at the 50 of Yosemite Valley or something, and from, from Canyon View or somewhere, you're going to get this narrow little view. He said, it wasn't like that. There were the mountains over in the left and on the right and everything. And the yes. wide angle does that. Yes. Oh, but, a, but a 50 is a 50 is a narrower field of view than the eye is. The field of view of the eye is really more like uh, uh, 60, 70, something like that. So yeah, you're just... actually seeing more with the 50 than what your eye would. Yeah, feel the view of your eye. Yeah, yeah. I'm just it, it depends on the on the what part of the eye. Typically, they say that the the eye and the brain combination together. What I've heard is it's about twenty four millimeters. Oh, wow! 
Okay. Okay. Well, anyway, wide angle <laughs> versus narrow angle. Wide angle versus narrow. And here, looking for something with a telephoto is a challenge. Um, you know, trying to pick out a pattern with the telephoto, you know, maybe here. Eh, kind of not really. So to me, this is a wide angle shot. Okay, uh, something similar, a vertical at 16 and then semi-cropped towards a 15. Again, uh, what I like about the wide angle, this is my toes are almost here. You know, if I turn the camera down just a little bit more, I'd see my feet and then I get this great sky. We're shooting with a narrower um, uh, f-stop uh, or a zoom. Uh, I don't get the same effect. Again, nice, but to me, I like the wide angle. Okay, wide angle and slow shutter speed and a sun star. I don't know how many times you've actually seen a real sun star with your naked eye. It doesn't happen. So that's also creating something uh, with the camera. Again, wide angle, 17. And this to me doesn't seem so wide looking at it, but uh, it's just this wide expanse. Um, atmospherics are huge. Um, you know, shooting this on a bright sunny day would not have the same impact and it probably wouldn't even bring out the camera. So fog and atmospherics are awesome. Uh, wide angle. Dan, when, where is, was the place, the, the one, this one, where is the location? I mean, which, which city or state? Let me, let me check my GPS. Oh, damn it. <laughs> I just love this kind of pose. The, the, this is, the, yeah, this is awesome. This is the old town of Valdez, Alaska. Oh. Wow wiped out by a earthquake and a tidal wave. So this is remnants of Old Town uh, Valdez and it's a spooky place. Oh gosh, especially with this overcast light mist, it, it, we could feel the ghosts. It was really strange. The new yeah, town we, of Valdez is right here. Well, we drove by there. I've never seen anything like this. <laughs> <laughs> Um, they've, they've, um, yeah. How did you even find a place like this? Oh, uh, I was with a friend who, uh, actually Ed Pinsky, who, um, who has a house in Valdez and he knows the area. We drove out into it and, um, um, you know, I, I kind of laugh, Lily. I always say that I haven't met a dirt road that I haven't liked or wanted to drive down. <laughs> um, and Ed constantly says, Dan, how did you find this? And I said, well, there was a road, there was a track, and uh, I have this jerk in my arm on the steering wheel. It goes either right or left. <laughs> not definitely, it's not on the main road. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so if you get there again, you can go to the uh, old town um, I'm not sure exactly how to tell you, but then now some of this stuff has been taken away, but there's signposts, there's some interesting placards that explain about the, uh, the history of the place. Mm. But there are some serious ghosts here. This was one of the, you know, it was, I'm sure it was 90% me, but there was also something there in the air. It was weird. Thanks. And uh, again, wide angle, um, long exposure. I love this depth from my feet into the sky. Yeah, Dan, on these, do you use a, a neutral density filter very often? Yes, yes. Uh, see, exposure here was two and a half seconds at F22 at ISO 50. So I'm going as slow as I can. I've got in my kit a, uh, I always have the polarizer on, which gives about, what, two stops or so. 
And this is probably with a four stop ND plus the um, polarizer and uh, probably a two or three stop grad, which darkened the sky. I'm, I'm a, still a big believer in uh, graduated neutral density filters because I can't always do this in one exposure in Lightroom Photoshop. I was kind of curious about the uh, eye focal length for a reason personally, but uh, Mike is right and you're right. I just Googled it. And the, okay. <laughs> the, the approximate focal length of the eye is 22 millimeters. But the field of view uh, in simple, your um, depth of field is get, becomes very, very narrow on the outside. It's kind of a simplification of it. So it's okay. really wide, but you only, only can see a sharp center, so to speak. Okay, that makes good sense, Hutch. Cool. Actually, that's kind of good to know because, yeah, 20, I can see my hands way out here. Yeah. but I can't really see them. Yeah. As I move in, yeah, now I can. So cool. Well, I was kind of curious is, is I've been, typically I shoot with a 2470 and a 7200. And just, okay. just for the heck of it, my little trip up to Morro Bay, I put my 2470 and my 7200 away and dusted off my 1635 and my 100-500. Uh, nice. I'm not going to take the other two out of my bag. <laughs> but my eye is having a hell of a time adjusting because I very rarely shoot with a 1635. My eye is having a hard time adjusting to, I got to get closer and I got to get closer and I got to get closer. <laughs> <laughs> my, my love it, Hutch. So, yeah, uh, yeah my 20, uh, my 7200 uh, gets pulled out now to do art yeah. rep, rep, uh, reproductions. That's about it. Or uh, headshots. It's in the bag. I just use my 300 now. My 28300, even though the 7200 is a much sharper lens. My little local hikes, I'm taking only my 1635 with me. I'm having so much fun with it, but I tell you, it's an adjustment for my eye to get used to the darn thing. <laughs> I love it. I really love it. Okay, so that's, that's oh, and then this um, wide angle shot at 16, uh, uh, half a second. Uh, raining drizzling great atmospherics and just an amazing amazing place this is called the uh, moab syncline and uh, it's a long drive to get here moab is just 20 miles but to get here it's about an 80 mile drive uh, but fantastic place again what your eye what your eye doesn't normally see um Wide angle again, and uh, this is Bolivia. And uh, so wide angle works pretty well for everything except people. <laughs> well, it works there too. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it kind of does. That's actually a fisheye. Was that um, the lens or was that what was in the bottle? Uh, both. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so telephoto. Okay, we talked about this one already. Uh, anything longer than 100, we know it starts to compress and shorten distances, and the eye doesn't see like that. So uh, it takes that kind of depth of field and collapses it, which I think is one of the special things about telephoto. Uh, you pick out details. So this is from there. So here's wide at 24. Here's the same color, but just shot with the telephoto. Again, your eye doesn't necessarily see this because your eye now is looking at that whole big scene. Picks out details, patterns, uh, compositional elements. Um, this kind of thing I really enjoy doing. And it, it begs a question, what is it? So all of these great sinuous lines of dark shadows and this one little bush. Um, I 
Oops, that's not what I wanted. This is what I wanted. Um, 105 millimeters standing looking down at water. Uh, there's a guy in Moab named Bruce Hucko who really, really is good at this kind of artistry. Um, skies. And we've all seen this kind of blurry work with the ocean. Um, stuff. With the wide angle and the telephoto, we get a certain amount of lens distortion. And uh, I kind of like it. We get lens distortion and a bit of a natural vignette that comes with the lens. And in most cases, I end up leaving that in. If you hit the lens adjustment in Lightroom, it will flatten it out, which works great for people's faces. But I kind of like that additional distortion. It just adds a little bit more tension to the image. Okay, so macros, we all kind of know what macros are. Again, to me, it's surreal. This is just playing with a bit of moss on a uh, red blanket. <laughs> One thing I have, I finally got around to buying a real macro lens and uh, boy, what a difference. It is a lot better than using the macro stacks. Even though the macro stacks were cheap and very light, uh, the 105 Sigma is just the bomb. It's really nice. And with this, you get very little, almost no distortion. Okay. That's really nice. This is fun. I'm lying on the ground underneath looking up and um, um, manually focusing with uh, the the one, 105 macro. Okay. Long. The, new, the new Canon 100 for the mirrorless. It's got a new ring. You know, so it's not on the street. It's got a new ring besides the focus and what have you. It's got a new ring for changing the depth of field. I don't know. How it does it. I don't know how it does it, but <laughs> <laughs> I can't wait to, to find out. <laughs> yeah, you've got it. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So long exposure is something else that's really, to me, um, integral to photographing any kind of moving water or moving sky. This was surprisingly shot at eight tenths of a second at f22. And I love the motion. I tend to overshoot at 30 seconds because I love that milky blur of the ocean. Uh, and then sometimes I come back wishing I would have shot a few at a faster shutter speed. Uh, here I just waited until the wave came in and then on its way back out. And it gave those really nice patterns. And this is shot, this sunset shot was shot at 1.22 in the afternoon. So that's not a sunset. <laughs> um, at times, this phenomenon has happened where we have a storm cloud where it's not super thick and it lets this amazing light through. So coastal times, sometimes we've had just these amazing light in the middle of the day. So don't be afraid to take out your camera when the light looks sucky. The, uh, the camera sees some amazing things. Here we go. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I remember that picture. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't have a problem. I, I really did want a focal point to, uh, you know, or an anchor uh, to this image. And so this is, a, this is a double exposure, one for the sky and one for the foreground and blended, actually one for this area and then one and blended together by hand in, uh, in Photoshop. But again, slow, um, slow exposure. This is 20 seconds. And it gives us really milky. And again, your eye does not see this. Okay. 
I see love this wandering sky. And then these amazing, this is again, marble pocket. Okay, so we are at 845. How, how long was the exposure on this shot? This is 20 seconds at F22. I saw 200. So uh, probably put the four stop on and uh, the polarizer. Unfortunately, the EXIF data doesn't tell you your, 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 the filters on the end of the camera. That would be really nice. Um, but I love this streaking sky. And uh, to take this without the streaking sky is just kind of a nice image, but it doesn't create this strangeness in the sky. Okay, so ghosts, this is just kind of fun. Walk around and stand in front of the camera. Well, this is four seconds, so I had to move pretty quickly. So then you said uh, you re remote control your shutter speed and the shutter. So you're standing in front of this picture and then you yeah. shoot selfie. Yeah, actually what I did, I probably put it on two second delay, clicked the shutter and then walked around and stood in front of it. And did it about five or six times until I got one that actually worked. And you you move right away, right? Yeah, you I moved into it and then just stood there. Uh, you know, by the time I got there, the shutter was already open and then just stood there until it finished. And it's completely guess and check. It's shoot and try and shoot and try. I think I did five or six of them. Hmm. It's not it's real, post. It's <laughs> really fun. <laughs> It's really fun. And that's done all in camera. Right. Yeah. And this was amazing because this was, uh, I didn't know how I was able to get everything in line here. It's just a wild guess. So here's a difference between Fuji Velvia and the Canon new digital sensor. Yep. Uh, I think the days of film being better than digital are long, long, long gone. A uh, couple more here. In-camera movement. These are kind of fun. And again, sometimes they'll work. Sometimes they're just weird. This one seemed to work. It got, it was the first and only 100 I've ever received as a score in image comp. So this was shot at one second with just light vertical movement in, uh, with the camera. So I just moved the camera up and probably just straight up. And, um, you know, these things are kind of fun, but again, I'm intrigued with this one. Fortunately, there's one bird here that actually kind of tells you what it is. I think we talked something. Larry, you have something similar to this. Uh, yeah, yeah, I do. Yeah, uh, we can we can both conspire to enter them at the same time or not. And here again, the in camera movement. Oh, with dust spots. That's interesting. Oh yeah, um, fun. But does it really tell a story? Not really. Um, same, this is actually in camera movement in the Salar de Uni in Bolivia at a person and all of a sudden it becomes a little bit strange. But from here, which is cool to hear, wow, there's a store, what, a surf, yeah. And in camera movement, now, I pretty much would use this just as maybe a background pattern same. Pretty cool. I keep doing them. I haven't ever really done anything with them. So anything else that can be done in camera as a, as a surreal scape? The guy in Scotland, I, I really, I wish I could think of his name, that is doing this really neat ICM what he does, he holds the camera out at arm's length, okay? Uh -huh. Sets it on about a second uh, shutter. Then he whips his wrist and 
pauses. Okay, that's so, sounds cool. So you get the, the movement, but you'll do it like with a castle. And then the castle outline is in the midst of the movement. And you know, you look at his image, you think, oh, he's got to have done that compositing in Photoshop, but he's actually doing it in camera. So it's a whip of the wrist and freeze before. So you get like a, you know, a quarter of the one second exposure. It's very, very cool, but it takes a hundred shots to get one good one, but. I'm gonna have to give that a try, Hutch. I have yeah. done some of that in weddings with the uh, uh, zooming. Yeah. Uh, focus in on the couple dancing, hit the shutter and zoom it. And then everything else goes streaky. Right. With the, sh the, the couple semi-sharp. You want, I'm, I'm pretty sure I could find him. I could probably look it up and send you his, uh, he's got a video, he's got a tutorial on how to do it. It was actually somebody here in the US that learned it from him that did a YouTube thing that I saw. Okay. And then referred me to his YouTube thing. And mm -hmm. Well, that'll be fun. Mm -hmm. Give that a try. So here's something called Orton Glow. Does anybody know what this is? Yeah. Okay, yeah. it's a combination of Gaussian blur and uh, a blend mode. Pretty much everything I do in Photoshop, I understand how it works. Orton Glow, I just took a recipe and made myself an action. I don't completely <laughs> understand how it works. Okay, so I just click the button and then adjust it. But what it does, it can give you this nice, soft, this is not about detail. This is about color and feeling. And actually, I don't know about you guys, but I really like this. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I like it a lot. It's a little bit of a painterly uh, feel to it. Um, so I'll give an example. There's a really, really subtle difference here. I don't know if you can make that out. Moving back and forth. I'm going to jump to this other example. OK, here's a long exposure, um, 30 seconds. And here's with a little bit of Orton Glow. It's subtle. Subtle, because it can be overdone. Mm -hmm. Do you sense or see the difference? To me, it's just kind of like a finishing little touch. And then it can come into areas where we want more detail and just brush out the Orton. So this remains sharp and everything else ends up with this little bit of a glow. So the idea with it is, and then you can see I've lightened up the pathway and a couple of the other areas. So there's dodging and burning going on and some finishing touches. So it's kind of like a vignette, it's kind of like a polarizer, it's kind of like any effect. If you can look at the image and see, oh my gosh, that was polarized. Oh my gosh, that was vignetted. Oh my gosh, that was HDR'd. Oh my gosh, that's too much Orton. I think you've gone a little too far. But that is a nice trick. And uh, uh, I, can, I can give you a link to uh, a recipe. So how about some digital art? We'll just do a few of these and uh, call it a night. Yeah, when you sent that one for the preview, I really like that one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I like that one. Fits the, fits the surreal <laughs> feeling. Yeah, I love it. This is me standing in a field in Nevada with a lion from Namibia and a strawberry field over uh, Rincon. Really? Yeah. So we'll go here to Photoshop. Uh, wrong one. OK. So here's the final version with a little bit of Orton glow and a shadow. Let me move this out of the way. And here's where I started. <laughs> but I never guessed. <laughs> really? Wow. Yeah. 
And there we go. <laughs> That's this really, is really very cool. Yeah. This is really fun to do. Um, yeah. So how did I decide to even use this? I don't remember because that's a whole lot of boring nothing. I think alcohol was involved in that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, I blame it on CHD or THC, but uh, I haven't used any of that for years. So what do we got here? Okay, here's, here's another version, different one. From here, oh, let's see, do I have the, okay, here's the finished version with some Orton Glow applied. You can see the colors are soft and, and um, so what, uh, what I do, here's all my layers. When I finish an image, I maintain all of the layers. And this is the same whether I'm doing something strange in Photoshop, or even if I got just three layers. Uh, I call this a master. And I'll always come back to the master to do anything else. So here's where I started. and then added a little bit of Orton Glow. So I've created an action with uh, Orton Glow. So all I need to do is hit that button in the action and, and it will apply the Orton Glow. And Orton Glow, here's all of the steps to it. We won't go through that tonight. Uh, I can send you a link with the recipe, but Orton Glow is a nice trick to add uh, as long as you don't do too much. And then the finished image. And these are really quite fun. It takes a while. And um, um, the uh, inspiration came from a Facebook uh, person I follow called Josh Adamski. And he doesn't have a huge following, but he does these amazing blurs. And so I looked at that and just went into Photoshop and said, okay, I'm going to start trying to do some of this. And ended up with this. How do you spell his last name? A-D-A-M-S-K-I. There's a there's a Adamski effect. Oh, is there? So yeah. he does amazing stuff. I mean, these things are just outrageous. Some are better than others. This one's kind of corny. This one's fun. Uh, this one doesn't work at all. <laughs> this is pretty cool. So um, looking at his work, and I haven't done any vertical stuff like this, but I want to try this. <laughs> and it's great. Yeah. Looks like he's got a vertical and horizontal going on there. That's too cool. <laughs> so um, yeah, so I saw his work and then I've got to try and do some of this. Um, and uh, there's a couple more I'll, I'll show you here. So what else have I done with? Okay, we, we saw this one already. This one's quite fun. Again, simple. Any guess of where the background is from? Ventura? <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, uh, White Sands <laughs> with that. Um, uh, amazing evening light and um, belt of Venus. And uh, Hutch will probably start recognizing these birds because I've been using them pretty regularly. Yep. And that moon. But this is the first time you've seen the tree. It's an early version. That moon looks familiar. This was fun. So this is, is a, a blurred background of the Salarte Uni and then a picture of me and actually the lighting works and just flipped it over to make the reflection and blurred the reflection just a little bit. Saw that one. Uh, this is actually a skyline of Los Angeles and I don't even remember how I did that. <laughs> 
this is pretty simple, but actually quite fun. Um, so one thing that I thought was, was interesting and it has puzzled some judges is I'll go in and make some of the areas sharp <laughs> with the rest of it blurred and with the bird sharp and they're going, wait, that just doesn't make sense. And then you go, oh yeah, it's illustrative. It doesn't have to make sense. Same here with the, the blur and the, uh, the mountains sharp, the pterodactyls and the boat. It was really hard to get a shadow. One thing if you want to ground anything, you really do need to have some kind of a shadow. Otherwise it looks like it's just pasted in, which it is. Judge here could not get the fact of the bird sharp, the blur, and why is this wave sharp? Well, because it can be. Recognize the birds? <laughs> yep. I need more birds. <laughs> and this was a vertical, a vertical blur. And we've seen that. So anyway, it could keep on going, but that's kind of a little bit about surrealscaping. That was Josh Adamski? Yes, okay, okay. Yeah, I got him. Josh Adamski. Now here, okay, here is Gaital, G-U-I-T-A-L. And uh, if you want, I can put these, do you want me to put these links in the chat? I think I have Guy Cal in the chat already. I okay. But I don't have, Josh only has Facebook site and Instagram, it looks like. His Instagram is more people and pretty cats. Hmm. Okay, Nafizi, wow. Wow. I am just amazed at this person. If you send us some, some of the links, with your bio for the for the video i'll put them on the introduction to the video so people okay. can can go to that if you don't mind yeah I'll, absolutely i love to share these i mean this is nuts i love this and it's um it's not you know i've seen a lot of composite work especially with portraits it's just starting to get boring to me but this stuff is great i mean how cool is this so that's Nafizi, Peter Zarkub. Now, again, he's a little more literal, but not really. You know, I look at this and I go, I look at what I've done. I go, man, I'm a piker. <laughs> 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 And uh, Catherine Federer, also really quite good. I just, this is so cool. So I don't know how much she creates in camera, how much she does in post, but it doesn't matter. The neat thing about this is this is not computer work trying to fool you thinking it's real. This is just straight art. Yeah. Yeah, this is nuts stuff. Oh, one, thing, one thing that seems very typical of these is they're they're all really simple. I've seen other stuff that people have done where they just combine all kinds of garbage and you can't figure out what the thing is about. Oh my God, you have 500 layers of, uh, yeah, some of it's pretty impressive, but I love this work. It's just, you're absolutely right, Dennis. It's really simple and really clean. I mean, this is nuts. I, I I don't even know how she does this. That's pretty cool. So Dan, can I ask you a question? Yes, uh, please. You brought up the fact that it doesn't matter whether it's done in camera or done in post. 
So my question starts with the fact that a lot of this photo you're showing, now your photos, the ones you have on the screen now, are to me so far removed from realistic photography that it's become digital art. Yes. And so um, since I'll be talking about this uh, topic for this evening, experimental art, are we talking then about experimental digital art? Or are we talking about experimental um, photography? In other words, where do you see photography going in the future when you can do digital art that's so much more powerful, so much more capable than ordinary old photography? Oh, that's a wonderful question, kid. And that's really kind of the schizophrenia we're dealing with. <laughs> Because, you know, if you look at something like this, you know, that's, that's like a painting. You know, that's not photography. That's a digital artwork. But then we come back to, um, where we'll just try natural abstracts. To me, this is, this is pure photography here. Correct. Correct. That, that, I agree with that. Yours is more in the experimental photography rather than the digital art domain. Would yes. you agree with that? Yeah, and playing with digital art is a blast. Oh my gosh, it's fun. Um, and I look at some of these people and I just go, how did you even come up with a concept? Um, so, 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 but going into the future, remember at the beginning of the session, I asked you what is uh, experimental art yesterday, today is just everyday art. What, and what is today Ex experimental, tomorrow might become something, you know, blasé. So okay. what I'm asking now is that um, given what you've seen, the, what people have done with digital art, and if you go to movies nowadays, you know, a lot of the, uh, the movies are digital art. Why bother doing photography going forward? Oh, gosh, if I had a, if, if we were in person, you'd definitely get a card for that um inspiration yeah you know because i'll just look here at the um what i call these uh, natural abstracts and this is painting with the camera and you really can't do any of this in post so this is this is seeing and creating with the camera um and the only post done work is with contrast and color. And uh, so to me, it's, it's two different things. Um, but they are merging. Yeah, but what personally I don't do and won't do is create something like this in post and try and make you think I shot it with a camera if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, so my paintbrush, my palette is here. This is something that I saw in real life where um, these are things that I created in post with the computer. So uh, to me, it's still a separate thing. Uh, I know now Photoshop, you can change skies super easy. Uh, it's getting easier to do. I won't. I won't do something like this and change out the sky, um, no matter how easy it is. I might use it if I had a, uh, a real estate job that I had to shoot during the fog and needed something in the sky. I might use it for that. But I'll, I won't personally ever create a photograph that I didn't see. So that's just my own personal style. Um, there's a lot out there that are creating and the excuse is, well, it's, it's a landscape. I'd put in this beautiful sky and cause I can do it. And it's just like painting, but to me, no, it's not because by calling it a photograph, you are basically telling me that's what you saw in the image when you were out there. And to me, that's, that's not the way I roll. I don't want to, pretend I'm creating a realistic scene when it wasn't there. 
but that's just the way I feel. I don't know if that answered your question, Kit. Thank you. Um, I appreciate your answer. You're being very honest about it. And I think ultimately in photography, um, uh, honesty uh, in presentation is a key part of what is great photography. Thank you. I agree 100%. Um, you know, whether it's photojournalism or it's portraiture, um, if you're presenting it as something that you saw through the camera, then I think it personally, I, I, personally for me, it will be something that was there. Now I may bring out the Kai, I may burn and dodge, I may accentuate, I may do a little digital gardening and clean out some things that don't belong or I couldn't clean out. But otherwise, everything that you see here, I saw and took the photograph of. So that's just personally the way the way I I, I 